Um, last week, if you joined us, you would have um, seen that we spent a little bit of time in Psalm 23, thinking about the great shepherd. And what I want to do is just sort of launch from that place and move forward a little bit to think about shepherding in general, not so much as the great shepherd, although as we will discover today, that really does inform um, how we think about leadership in the local church, but we want to think about how the great shepherd informs under-shepherds, those who are entrusted to care for the flock of God in the season that we live in. So, I want to leave, leave um, you with the, the big idea at the very front, and then I'm going to move through a couple of passages that I think help inform our thinking, uh, particularly for local church shepherding leadership, and in general, yes, but certainly in Raymond Terrace Community Church. The big idea is this, local church leadership is uniquely modelled on the image of sacrificial servant leadership which is best seen in Jesus. I'm going to give that to you again. Local church leadership is uniquely modelled on the image of sacrificial servant leadership which is best seen in Jesus. So, a couple of questions. First is this, what is a pastor? Or maybe you could ask, what is an elder? If Jesus is the great shepherd, who are, who are these other guys who call themselves shepherds? Maybe another question we could ask is, why do we have pastors? Or are pastors and elders different? Maybe a question you've asked here, why aren't there any female pastors at Raymond Terrace Community Church? Does that mean that we're chauvinists here? Or maybe, what is a deacon? And why don't we seem to have any at Raymond Terrace Community Church, or at least people going by that title? They're all valid questions, and ones that we hear quite frequently, and this series is our attempt to give a biblical defence for why we understand and practice church leadership the way we do. It's going to be a little bit different to our usual preaching approach, um, less emphasis on working our way through a specific book of the Bible, which is what we would normally do, and we're going to be exploring various um, key passages that deal with this topic. But before we start in earnest, I want to define a couple of terms to make sure that we're all hearing the same thing. So, I realise that a lot of people that have arrived here at Raymond Terrace Community Church from varying church backgrounds, or maybe, maybe this is the first church that you've ever been a part of, that you will have seen different models of leadership exist in different Places. So, I just want to acknowledge that to begin with. Secondly, I also want to acknowledge the fact that, that there have been people who have been very hurt by those that call themselves shepherds of the local church, pastors or elders. This subject could be sensitive to you, it might be difficult for you, and we want to acknowledge that. Thirdly, that there are other church traditions and they come to different conclusions on this subject and a host of other ones as well. And that's okay. What we want to do in this series is just simply over the next three weeks, I think, try to explain and show what we do here and why without throwing stones at anybody else that may think, differently or condemning others. So, for the remainder of this series, we're going to be using a couple of key terms and I want to make sure that you understand the, the way that I'm intending to use them. Um, you're going to hear the term elder, you're going to hear the term pastor, and you'll hear the term shepherd or maybe even overseer. Look, it's our understanding from Scripture that these terms are all biblical 
terms and they all describe the same group of people or person maybe. So at Raymond Terrace Community Church, elder, pastor, shepherd and overseer are all used interchangeably. They don't describe different positions of leadership. In fact, mostly because the term is more broadly known in our culture and society, we tend to use the word pastor more frequently to describe the type of leader, local church leader in the local church. So what may be a little bit different to what you have been familiar with in the past maybe, is that we don't use the word pastor to describe someone who is paid in ministry. All our elders are pastors and only our elders are pastors. Uh, Currently in our church, we have four. Uh, We have Luke, who was leading a little bit earlier. Uh, We have Aaron, we have Tim, and we have myself. Uh, Four guys who have been entrusted for this season to be pastors, elders, shepherds, or overseers of the local church that gathers, even if it's only online, at Raymond Terrace Community Church. So now I want to get into the topic of, well, why is it these guys, right? Why those four? What makes them so special? Not a lot, really. (laughs) Um, I've seen them up close and personal. They've seen me up close. We're not that special. But who else could be a pastor here in the future? And we'll talk a bit more about that later as well. But before we do that, I want to spend predominantly this week in making sure that we understand what a pastor is. Because many of the heartaches which I think are experienced in churches around the issue of church leadership could have been avoided if there had been a better grasp of just simply understanding what a pastor is. So many models of leadership have been imported into church life, most of them drawn from successful business models or entrepreneurial startups, but we want to draw our reference from Scripture itself. So that's where we're going to turn our attention today. What is a pastor? What is our reference point for healthy, biblical church leadership? So here's the first thing that I... We're trying to summarise what a pastor is. We need to start at the right reference point with the true shepherd, the true shepherd. Now, I'm not going to go back over in great depth what we covered last week, but this is where we would turn back to Psalm 23. I am going to read it and make a couple of highlighted points. Psalm 23 from the Christian Standard Bible says this, The Lord is my shepherd, I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures, He leads me beside quiet waters, He renews my life, He leads me along the right paths for His name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Here's a couple of highlighted points from that psalm. If you'd like to go back and hear a bit more in depth about that, you can go back to a recording from last Sunday. We spent a whole week here. But here's the highlights. For the ultimate shepherd, we must only look to Jesus. Our deepest and fullest satisfaction can only be met in Him. Number two, He is the source of our satisfaction. He nourishes us with what we need. Three, He gives us life and He walks with us through life. And four, even when that path leads through places that we would never choose to go, we can be comforted in knowing that this is not a surprise to our shepherd and neither will He abandon us there. Five, 
No one sits down to a leisurely meal while their enemies are right at their back, but we can because our shepherd is on duty. We have that security and we have that comfort because he is with us. Number six, we are tended to in our hurts and provided for in our needs by our shepherd. And the last one is that sheep know and experience belonging and love because the shepherd is in their life. So before we even really begin to ask what is a pastor in a local church, we have to identify the fact that we actually have a great pastor, a great shepherd, one that we look to ultimately for all of these things that we've just briefly highlighted. And yet, this same great shepherd has entrusted his flock in local places to other qualified or capable or able pastors under shepherds. So if we say, what is an elder? What is a pastor? What is a shepherd? This is where we must begin. We must first look to the great shepherd. Maybe you want to be a pastor. Psalm 23 is your job description. You won't do it perfectly. You won't even get close. But that's where we must begin. It's daunting, isn't it? Guess what? You would fail. How do I know that? Well, because I have. Because every under-shepherd has because we're not Jesus. I work shoulder to shoulder with other shepherds and and none of us live up to the Psalm 23 type of great shepherding because only one can. If I could do this, if any of the pastors here could do this, or the pastors in the church that you normally go to if you're just tuning in with us today, guess what? You wouldn't need Jesus. That's that's why we don't have a one-pastor model in this church. We pastor together, currently with four, accommodating each other's strengths and weaknesses, aiming to be an echo of the great shepherd, continually pointing to where your satisfaction can be found, not to ourselves, but to Jesus, the great and true and ultimate shepherd. So, pastors, or those who desire to be one, you cannot be Jesus to everyone. We already have a Saviour, and you're not it, neither am I. But we should show people what the shepherd is like. We should take on that type of family resemblance. We should experience, all of us, under the care of under-shepherds, a taste of what it feels like to be loved and cared for by the Good Shepherd. That's where we're going to turn our attention now, the Good Shepherd. So, in your Bibles, I want you to find the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 10. There's a beautiful passage here where Jesus refers to himself in the type of language that we're using today. I'm going to read to you just a few verses from John chapter 10, starting from verse 14. It says this, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. But I have other sheep that are not from this sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down, and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. 
the shepherd has a familiar voice. The shepherd has a familiar voice. Earlier in that same chapter, John chapter 10, starting from verse 1, says this, Truly I tell you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they don't know the voice of a stranger. Sheep know the voice of their shepherd. He's the good shepherd. And again, as we start to think about how that relates to under-shepherds, those that are called to be shepherds in the local church, our, our job is to continually be pointing and saying, listen for the voice of Jesus, listen for the voice of Jesus. And yet in our voices, there should be an echo of that same trust, that we would speak tenderly with the flock. And even when there must be correction, even there must be rebuke, it's done so with the voice of of someone who cares, someone who's calling to say, come into the flock. So hear the voice of Jesus, the tone of Jesus, the good shepherd. I want you to notice from that John 10 passage as well, though, that the shepherd is protection for the sheep. Jesus talked about the fact that he was the good shepherd, and that there were, there were thieves and there were robbers around. They climb in over the fence, he said. Have a listen to this from verse 7 from John chapter 10. Jesus said again, Truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. John 10.10, I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. So we're looking to this good shepherd, the one who protects. But here's the thing, the under shepherds are called to do the same. Local pastors, elders, shepherds, overseers, They're called to be ones who will stand in the gap for the people of God. They're called to be shepherds, not hired hands. And that's what we've called this entire series, shepherds, not hired hands. That's what our local churches need. That's what Raymond Terrace Community Church needs. We need shepherds, not hired hands. And here's the way that Jesus explains the difference between the two. You can find it in John 10, starting from verse 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, since he is not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he is a hired hand and doesn't care about the sheep. You see, in the first century, there could have been two different people that you might have seen working in the fields as you walked between, say, Jerusalem and Jericho, maybe. Maybe both of them, at a distance, looked like a shepherd. After all, they had the right clothes on, they had the funny curved stick in their hand that we often think about, and there were sheep everywhere. And maybe there was a pen close by where they were locked up for the night safely. But here's the main difference between a shepherd and a hired hand. What happens when danger comes? You see, the shepherd had a vested interest. They were his flock. He loved them. When the lion came, or in the case of young David, the shepherd from the Old Testament, when a bear came, he stood his ground. He protected the sheep. He stood in the gap. The hired hand... Well, 
He probably just shrugged his shoulders. He said, oh, they're not paying me enough for this. And off he goes. The sheep are not his concern. His job is. Jesus said that he is a shepherd, not a hired hand. And that's what he's looking for in the local church. Shepherds, those who love the sheep. Those who will stand in the gap for the sheep. Those who give their life for the sheep. Not someone who's just looking to fill a pay packet or to fill their quota of pats on the back or adoration or whatever it is that you may think pastors get. There's a difference between shepherds and hired hands and the local church must be a place where shepherds are. But I want you to look now to another passage. It's found in the Old Testament, book of Ezekiel. I'll give you a couple of minutes to find if you need to. Ezekiel chapter 34. Because in this picture that we have from the Old Testament, God presents himself in contrast to those who have been called to be shepherds of Israel. And here we find that we have a better shepherd. A better shepherd. Ezekiel chapter 34. Starting from verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, This is what the Lord God says to the shepherds. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Shouldn't the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat. Wear the wool and butcher the fattened animals, but you do not tend the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, healed the sick, bandaged the injured, brought back the strays or sought the lost. Instead, you have ruled them with violence and cruelty. They were scattered for lack of shepherds. They became food for all the wild animals when they were scattered. My flock went astray on all the mountains and every high hill. My flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth. And there was no one searching or seeking for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, this is the declaration of the Lord God. Because my flock... Lacking a shepherd has become prey and food for every wild animal. And because my shepherds do not search for my flock, and because the shepherds feed themselves rather than my flock, therefore you shepherds hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says. Look, I am against the shepherds. I will demand my flock from them and prevent them from shepherding the flock. The shepherds will no longer feed themselves, for I will rescue my flock from their mouths so that they will not be food for them. For this is what the Lord God says, See, I myself will search for my flock and look for them. As a shepherd looks for his sheep on the day he is among his scattered flock, so I will look for my flock. I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and total darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples, gather them from the countries and bring them to their own soil. I will shepherd them on the mountain of Israel, in the ravines and all the inhabited places of the land. I will tend them in good pasture and their grazing place will be on Israel's lofty mountains. There they will lie down in a good grazing place. They will feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will tend my flock and let them lie down. This is the declaration of the Lord. I will seek the lost, bring back the strays, bandage the injured and strengthen the weak, but I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will shepherd them With justice. This is God's word. There are high expectations for under shepherds. Those who Jesus calls to shepherd his flock are expected to do so in his name. 
And this carries with it massive responsibility. If you're called to shepherd, it isn't only those in the church that we stand responsible for, but ultimately we stand and give an account to the chief shepherd himself, the good shepherd, the better shepherd. And that can be a heavy burden to carry. There are high expectations for under-shepherds, but there are also realistic expectations that are needed for under-shepherds. Here's the good news for under-shepherds. You're not Jesus. Want to know even better news? Jesus doesn't expect you to be the saviour of his flock. They already have one. So to the pastors of this church, myself included, and to those who may be watching You don't need to try and be Jesus to everyone. So often we fall into the trap of developing a saviour complex, building dependency in our churches directed towards our own skills and gifts. What our churches really need is more Jesus, not more us. But to the members of this church, and the church you belong to if you're just visiting with us today, Don't don't look to your pastors for what only Jesus can supply. Your pastors love you and long to walk with you in your journey as a disciple, but don't place on their shoulders a load they will never be able to carry. Now, next week, we're going to explore in more detail some of the key New Testament passages that define the role of a pastor. But let's sum it up, up, I think, in a general role description as we take our cue from the great shepherd himself. Ezekiel 34 and verse 16, we've already read it once. I will seek the lost, bring back the strays, bandage the injured and strengthen the weak. If you're looking for a job description to look for in what is a pastor, we start with the great shepherd himself, the better shepherd. We, we draw our cues from him. But then we look to our under shepherds and we say, are they seeking the lost? Are they bringing back the strays, bandaging the injured, strengthening the weak? That's their job description. So I'm going to wrap up in a moment. The team's going to come back up here shortly and um, we'll finish off our service together. But before I do, I want to make just a a brief announcement. I said earlier that we had four pastors um, currently who are serving as under-shepherds, as pastors, as overseers, as elders. Um, For a long time, if you've been a part of this church for many years, you will know that uh, there was another member of our church who was acting in that position, Matt Blanche. And a number of years back, uh, due to family health and um, some of the circumstances of life at the time, Matt approached us and said that he felt uh, before the Lord that it would be good for him just to take a little bit of a step back. And those of you who know Matt know that Matt is a shepherd. He hasn't ceased to care for the flock, but he has ceased to operate closely with the eldership team and with the pastoral team in the day-to-day overseeing and care of the church. Well, we're just glad to announce that we've been in conversation with Matt over the last couple of months, actually, and Matt's desire is to step back into the gap with us, and we're looking forward to him doing that. Um, Just because of the due process, we're going to be talking about this in the next couple of weeks, about the processes that we use here. We would like to give the next two weeks as an opportunity for you to be praying for Matt, Um, In two Sundays' time, we would like to commission Matt and pray with him as he joins back into uh, the team of the the eldership and the pastoral work that's happening here formally. Uh, If in the next two weeks you have questions or um, concerns maybe about that process, we'd invite you to contact us as a pastoral team via our website or drop us an email to the church um, to set up an opportunity to share maybe your thoughts or expressions about that. But Lord willing, uh, in two weeks' time, we would like to commission Matt uh, back into that work 
that I know he loves and that we have been looking forward to him rejoining as well. We look to Jesus, our great shepherd. The expectations are high and yet we look to him. A pastor is someone who seeks the lost, brings back the strays, bandages the injured and strengthens the weak while all the while looking to the great shepherd ourselves. I'm going to pray. Thank you for sharing in the word with me this morning. Lord, thank you for being with us. Thank you that you are our great shepherd, that you tend to us. Lord, for those that are hurting in our church right now, maybe hurting from past experiences, even with leaders, people who call themselves pastors or shepherds, Lord, I pray that you would draw alongside them and tend to them in a way that no one else could. Heal their wounds. Strengthen them as they walk and seek to follow you. And Lord, help those who are called to be shepherds here in this church to be those that would echo the great shepherd and follow in his footsteps as we seek to do the same. Lord, help us, we pray. We're weak and we need your help, but we thank you that you have not abandoned us and we look to you. In your name we pray. Amen.